All right. To uh, wrap up our discussion on functions and subroutines and whatnot, I wanted to look at some of the scoping issues that we're going to run into. Um, this is for some of the more interesting cases, right? We've looked at the idea of using the, the runtime stack for handling local variables and whatnot. But what about dynamic scoped functions, right? How do we handle this idea that a function should be able to see the local variables for the function that called it, or the function that called that one, or the function that called that one? How do we handle that? Or if our language allows nested function declarations, where we have a function declared inside a function declared inside a function, you know, do those inner functions get access to the local variables from the enclosing functions? And if so, how do we go through and implement that? So those are some of the things that I want to take a look at in this set of, or this video. So in both cases, either the function needs some way to get at the stack frames for those other functions, so some way to kind of chain back through the ones that are relevant, or else we need some kind of different separate mechanism to go off and store the variables and give functions access to them. So we'll take a look at dynamic scope first, and we're going to look at one of those alternative mechanisms, the idea that we're going to have some different way for the function to get at the relevant variables. So the way we'll work it this time is that each variable name is going to have its own stack. So I'm going to have a stack for x's, and I'm going to have a stack for y's, and I'm going to have a stack for foo's. Any variable name that I use in my program, I'm going to have a stack for that name. And then what we'll do is every time a function declares a variable, we'll push it on top of that stack, on top of the stack for the variables with that name. So the most recently declared one in our call sequence is always on the top of the stack. And then when that function completes, when that variable goes out of scope, we pop it off the stack. So a function gets called, it pushes its local variables on the relevant stacks, it runs, it accesses them, they're on the top of the stack, it exits, it pops them off the stack. And if it goes to access, say, a variable z that it hasn't declared, it takes a look on the top of the z stack, and sure enough, there is the version of z that was defined by the function that called it, or the function that called that one, or the function that called that one. The most recently defined version of z is always on top. Now, it does mean that we've got to have some kind of a mechanism for keeping this you know, list of stacks or collections of stacks that are indexed by the name of the variable that we want. But it's a perfectly viable approach. This will work just fine. The other approach is to say, well, if we don't want to do that, then I need a way for my current function call to look at the stack frame for the function that called it. And if I don't find what I'm looking for there, I need to be able to go back to the stack frame for whoever called that. You know, see if, if I'm looking for variable z, the most recent definition of variable z, right? I look in my own stack frame. If it's not there, I look in whoever called me. I look in their stack frame. If I don't find it there, I go back and look at the, the stack frame before it. So you need some kind of a mechanism for chaining backwards through the stack frames. So maybe each frame has got a list of the variables defined in it, you know, a, a linked list or whatever it might be, a linked list of the variables defined in it. They're offsets within the frame. So we've got some kind of a list that says, okay, here's the stuff that I've declared. Here's where they are. And then something else that is a pointer to the previous stack frame that says, if you don't find what you're looking for here, then, you know, go look at the, the previous stack frame and find their list of variables go through that and you just keep going backwards through the chain if you run out right if you get back to say the main routine and it still doesn't have it defined then you go look at the global variable section and if it's not defined there then you throw an error and say oh no not defined but you've got this mechanism for working your way backwards through the chain 
Yet another possibility is to say, well, what if, and this is a, a kind of a lispy approach, what if we were to say, I'll keep a list of everything that's been defined so far, and when I call a function, I'll pass the function that list. So if I'm a function, I'm getting past this environment list, this things that have been defined so far and what their values are. If I'm defining local variables and or resetting the values of variables, then I update that list. And if I call a function, I pass my updated list on to them. And so they've got my version of it to work from. And so everybody's got this environment list that's been updated and customized kind of just for them so far, just dealing with their call sequence to this point. So, of course, there you are dealing with the idea that, you know, these environment lists could potentially get pretty significantly large, depending on how many local variables and parameters and things you're defining and how deep your, uh, your call list is getting. But it is certainly a possibility for going through and just making sure that everybody's got some kind of version of what things look like right now at the point where they've been called. So those are three different possibilities for handling dynamic scoping. If we want to look at having nested function definitions where a function is defined inside a function, inside a function, inside a function, then we've got some of the same sorts of issues where that inner function when it runs, it needs to be able to get this at the stack frame. You know, if uh, if f is defined inside g, then maybe f should be able to get at the local variables that were declared in f, or in g rather. So f needs access to g's stack frame. The same sort of idea as we did with the, the dynamic scoping. So we might have it set up so that each child gets access to the stack frame for its parent. And that would have access to the stack frame for its parent, and that would have access to the stack frame for its parent, etc., etc., etc. So two different children of a parent wouldn't have access to each other's stack frames, but they'd each have access to their parents and to their grandparents and so on up the chain. And then you could use some kind of a frame searching approach to work backwards, you know, look and see if it's defined in your own stack frame. If not, then check your parents. If not, then check your grandparents, you know, da 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 da. Eventually check the global scope, and if it's not there, then you can throw an error. But there are certainly, you know, again, mechanisms that you can use to go through and say, okay, well, I, I can support this. I can come up with an implementation that will make this work. And those are some of the, the issues that I want you to think about whenever you're dealing with new features in a programming language, where, wherever you're looking at something that's different than you've worked with in the past, think about how it might actually be implemented. How does this work? How do they make this happen? And if you can think about that, then you can better utilize it in the language you are working with. But you can also then take a look, you know, if you've got a, a language that doesn't support the feature that you're looking for, you can think about ways to support it yourself, to implement it yourself, to come up with your, your own customization, if you like, in your source code that lets you do the things that some other language does. All right, we will leave it there for now.